What's up, devotees of the Seventh Art? Cinemas are reopening this week, so it's the most inopportune time for me to be going off on one about something on TV. But seriously, why are we talking about anything other than the Underground Railroad, based on the novel by Colton Whitehead and directed by Barry Jenkins? The Underground Railroad is set in the antebellum American South, a place and a time where slavery is legal. Cora and Caesar, played by Tusu Mabedo and Aaron Pierre, are two slaves on a plantation where grotesque cruelty is commonplace, quite aside from, though naturally linked to, the existing cruelty of slavery itself. So they set out to escape using the Underground Railroad. Now, the history books teach us that this was a slang term for the secret routes and safe houses for those getting away from slavery. But in this drama, there is literally a secret underground railroad, drivers, stations and conductors. It takes Cora to a place of possible safety in an alternative reality version of South Carolina in which they are notionally free and able to take jobs. Cora works in an immersive history museum about slavery, pretending to be a field hand picking cotton for the benefit of tourists. But this new freedom is an illusion. She may have to take the underground railroad further north. This extraordinary drama isn't quite a steampunky sci-fi satire. It's more daring than that and more disturbing than that. It avowedly takes its inspiration from Swift's Gulliver's Travels, a book which crops up repeatedly. And I'm not being facetious when I say that in its weird sense of mystery and suspenseful excitement, not only about what's going to happen in the plot, but what actually the whole thing means, the Underground Railroad is like Patrick McGowan's TV show, The Prisoner. The railroad itself is sort of like a time machine, but it's powerful because you can sort of believe that it does literally exist, like the underground tunnel pulley system in The Great Escape. And what is this sensational story about? More than just slavery, Steve McQueen's equally stunning drama Twelve Years a Slave found its impact in the simple fact of a black man taken from a place where slavery is not allowed and placed where it is. Slavery allowed, slavery not allowed, the sheer juxtaposition is disturbing, as it is when you think of it in temporal terms. Time when slavery is allowed, time when slavery is not allowed, very close, historical neighbours. Nothing was given. All was earned. Hold on to what belongs to you. What's their name? The Underground Railroad defamiliarizes the subject of slavery and finds a way of telling us that, yes, it really did happen and not so long ago, and that the South were not defeated with unconditional surrender like Germany at the end of World War II. It was more like Germany at the end of World War I. This is about more than just slavery, if such a subject can be dismissed with the phrase more than just. The Underground Railroad is about the tragic foundations of America's industrial greatness. This is another resounding success for director Barry Jenkins, and it's streaming on Amazon Prime right now. Next up on the big screen, and I can't think of a Radio 2 link for this, it's Peter Rabbit 2, The Runaway. Is anyone hungry? Yes, yeah, starving. I'm on it. Ew. I'm just going to wait until we get home where the food isn't decomposing. Well, la dee -da. I didn't realize I was with a bunch of sophisticates. The new Peter Rabbit film is here, as before, cheekily voiced by James Corden. 
presenting a U certificate entertainment which shows rabbits wisecracking and getting up to larks, but thankfully uninterested in breeding or sexual congress of any sort. It combines live action humans and CGI bunnies whose coexistence on camera is seamlessly achieved as before in that bright, flat, bland light as if the screen has been laminated. Naturally, we were all hoping that Peter Rabbit 2 would show Peter Rabbit's dad as a young man in the old country, a bandit in the countryside, interspersed with scenes showing his grown up son becoming increasingly ruthless as he embraces his violent destiny in the stolen carrot business. But no. The scenario now is that the author, Beatrix Potter, or B, Rose Byrne, is now happily married to the once feared Thomas McGregor, played by Donald Gleeson with oddly darkened hair and eyebrows. They are asked to come up to London by smoothie publisher Nigel Basil Jones, played by David Oyelowo, who is only interested in turning her books into a soulless commercialised travesty, a meta gag about this very film franchise. Meanwhile, Peter gets upset with how mean and cross Thomas can be with him, so he falls in with a criminal rabbit called Barnabas, voiced by Lenny James, who becomes an ersatz father figure to poor, lonely Peter. He becomes a runaway, pursuing a life of crime with Barnabas and his dodgy new crew of reprobates. Now, there are one or two nice gags here, but basically the humour in the Peter Rabbit franchise is wacky slapstick stuff, pretty weak and pitched at young kids. Unlike Paddington, whose literary source material is genuinely funny, this digital Peter Rabbit is never really humorous. It can sometimes be cute or zany or briefly send itself up, but there is fundamentally something pretty straight in its DNA. Now it's time for something which is the most surprising and probably the best film of the week. It's Rare Beasts by Billy Piper. As well as acting and directing, Piper plays Mandy, a single mum who lives with her own mum, played by Kerry Fox, and Mandy's brought a dodgy man home. Hey. Marion. Just came back from Irish Artillery. We're gone in a minute. Sorry. Stayed? Yes. How long? How long are you staying for? Indefinitely. He's joking. He'll be off soon. Well, I'll have breakfast first. We don't eat breakfast here. You're religious. Nothing to be scared of. Well, we're all atheists here, Pete. It's put us in good stead. Has it? Take her away. No. Mm. I mean yet. And what about work? What about Larch? Larch too. Really? My friend Cressida, you know, um, Cressida from development. Not by face. She's an old family friend. She's getting married. She's very likeable. But I think we should go. We should go and watch people being happy. Rom-coms are about love and they want to be loved. Billy Piper's anti-rom-com is about something else and it wants something else from us. Rare Beasts has got the structure and the ingredients of a romantic comedy, but it turns everything on its head. On paper, this could be by Richard Curtis. There are attractive views of London, an awful date in a restaurant, bittersweet scenes with parents, reflective moments by the river, a Bridget Jonesy media job, a wedding scene, and even a cameo for Lily James. But everything goes wrong. Billy Piper's movie refuses to read the room. It ignores the traditional cues for comedy, and gentleness and the learning of life lessons. It is on a spectrum of its own. Now, I have to admit it, the last time I saw something as bleak as this was at the Samuel Beckett Festival in Enniskillen. Look, you're late every day. I love you. Your breath smells. You're angry, seething. Ah! You know people are calling you Scottish. <laughs> Not Scottish. In a way, Rare Beasts is a 90 minute nightmare fantasy sequence showing what might happen if you took the wrong choice. If you got into a relationship with the wrong guy in the speed date montage, because in real life, that is exactly what people do. Go into Rare Beasts expecting a funny romantic film and you will have a rough time. Go for a challenging psychological satire and well, you'll still have a very rough time, but you'll see a very smart piece of work from a very smart new filmmaker. I want to close now with a shout out for a brilliant Zoom video film podcast from India called Film Kapath, for whom I recently did a special edition about Tarantino. Here's a taster.
I don't care what you understand. You are going to freak out. It was just as exciting and as unwholesome and as dangerous and, and as horrible and transgressive as that. You felt like you were just getting jabbed for you some sheer kind of narcosis. So I had no idea when I first saw Pulp Fiction. I, did, I thought, wow, John Travolta has ended this movie alive and dead at the same time. I really didn't like Inglorious Bastards. Everybody in the world loves that film. But no. I sit there in the audience and he will say, hey, remember those uh, 60s Hong Kong uh, Kung Fu movies? Do you remember those? Yeah. <laughs> and the difference is he really does know them. He really knows about them all. He's, he enfolds you in this weird conspiratorial embrace of the marginal, the dispossessed world of pop culture, which never was admitted into the mainstream before Tarantino. In fact, he's put us Brits to shame with what he knew about our cinema, which we didn't care until he told us to care about it, and now we do care. Highbrow answer to that question, incidentally, uh, at, the, at the sophisticated dinner tables in London is Jackie Brown. I'll tell you this, if somebody says to you Jackie Brown, sure, but he's not, if somebody says Jackie Brown, it means they're not a real Quentin Tarantino fan. It's like... I don't know, it's like saying you're a Beatles fan and your favorite track is When I'm 64. Yeah. I don't believe for a moment Bruce Lee could have got defeated by somebody almost 25 years his senior, however much of a tough guy he was. No way would Bruce Lee go down to Brad Pitt. The link for that podcast is given below. I'm going to sign off now. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Please get your debit card out and buy my book, the films that made me, an edited selection of my essays and reviews for The Guardian. Give this vlog a like and a share on social media and hit that subscribe button with all your might. Until next time.